Okay, we'll do a little uh, additional lecture here on IV therapy. Uh, obviously, the uh, amount of uh, points they touched on in, in the text is, is a little on the slim side, so uh, we'll add a little bit to it, and hopefully this will uh, make everything look a little, uh, or seem a little easier to everybody. Okay, so for IV therapy, um, what things we're going to cover, we're going to talk about definitions and indications, fluid resuscitation, the different equipment and supplies, and then selecting appropriate items, the procedure for uh, peripheral vena puncture. Uh, we'll uh, touch briefly again on intraosseous access, look at some of those devices. Um, I have a slide that will talk a little bit about uh, potential complications. And then the last couple of slides in, in this PowerPoint are on central venous access devices. Um, while not typically within the scope of an advanced EMT, it's certainly something you're going to see uh, from time to time out there. Okay, so some definitions. Uh, IV and vena puncture. Um, IV intravenous means putting something within or inside the vein. Vena puncture itself simply means to put a hole into a vein. Um, typically, an IV is a type of vena puncture. More common vena puncture we talk about, though, is usually when we go to the hospital and have labs drawn. We also have peripheral versus central IVs. Peripheral are located in an extremity or in um, the external jugular veins. Um, and central would be something that would be found upon uh, the core of the body. Intraosseous access, as you know, is access to the vascular system via the bone marrow cavity. Fluid resuscitation, uh, that's a concept in which we're talking about when a patient is generally shocky uh, or hypoperfused, how we try to resuscitate them by uh, returning fluids into their system. Um, medication access, of course, is an, uh, an instance in which we would uh, start an IV uh, versus fluid resuscitation. So we either already need to give them fluid or we need to give them a medication or potentially give them a medication. We have a couple of different types of um, fluids we touch on, uh, crystalloids and colloids. Crystalloid solutions are those, um, and as we mentioned earlier, that have a crystal base in them. So think of it as salt or sugar. So a normal saline is salt and water. Sugar, dextrose 5% in water. Um, our crystalloids, uh, lactated ringers is kind of special because it's salt and some different types of salts uh, that typically uh, compose of that. Colloids, on the other hand, are protein-based. So the ultimate colloid is human blood. Um, that is not within the scope of practice of an advanced EMT, and even paramedics don't routinely give that in the field. They potentially would transport it from one spot to another. Um, but uh, other things like albumin, head of starch, dextran, those are some types of hypertonic solution, or I'm sorry, colloid solutions. When we talk about uh, solutions, we talk about whether or not they're hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic. Um, those terms specifically uh, refer to how similar are they to blood uh, as far as concentration of what they have within them. So hypertonic solution means a lot of solid, we'll call it solid, um, it's actually the solute, um, a lot of solute and a, and a smaller amount of solvent or the water part uh, compared to blood. So it's very thick. Isotonic is similar in uh, composition to blood, so very, very close. Hypotonic would be a lot more water, a lot less solvent, or a lot more, I'm sorry, a lot more solvent, and which would be similar to water, most cases water, and a lot less solute or solids um, compared to the blood. So an example, normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, is an isotonic solution. Lactated ringers is as well. They're both isotonic. They're very similar to uh, that of the uh, blood. Hypertonic solution 
uh, such as dextrose 50%, uh, very, very uh, uh, concentrated, it's going to pull water from the surrounding tissues into it or pull water from the bloodstream into uh, help dilute it. And hypotonic, on the other hand, uh, typically has extra water to give away, so typically it will start to flood other tissues around it. Um, these concepts we will touch more on when we're talking about pharmacology and when we're talking more about pathophysiology, but just a heads up. Drip rate, that has to do with how quickly we give a medication, I'm sorry, we give a uh, infusion, IV infusion. And then KVO and TKO, like previously uh, mentioned, is keep vein open or to keep open. So our indications for venipuncture, um, volume replacement, or access to the venous circulation. Those are the two major categories. Volume replacement, we typically or would be in the case of, say, dehydration, we would want to put water and or electrolytes back into the system. Um, in cases of blood loss, like a severe trauma, we would be talking, giving either colloid or crystalloid solutions to refill the container. Um, colloids being the closest thing that we have to blood is uh, the preferred, but they're not always available to us in the field and they're not within the scope of an advanced EMT. <clears throat> crystalloids, on the other hand, um, are very, very readily available. Venous access to circulation. Uh, we have blood collection occasionally where we're going to do some labs. Uh, most of the time, if we're going to do any of that collection, it would be just taken to the hospital with the exception of checking a blood uh, glucose. Or at the advanced or at the paramedic level, uh, we may be talking about doing some uh, minor labs in the field, doing a, a little uh, a quick uh, blood chemistry test. And the major reason why would be to administer or potentially administer medications. So fluid resuscitation uh, has to do with uh, replacing fluids and, lo and uh, bloods that, that are lost. Um, and generally, uh, it requires about two to three times the amount lost. There's kind of a two to one rule. They say for every liter of uh, blood lost, you need to replace it with two liters of fluid. This is controversial. Um, because of the fact that we can put all the normal saline into a person that we want. Normal saline doesn't carry oxygen. Normal saline doesn't function as blood. What it does is just takes up the space that blood should be. So are we really doing patients justice by flooding them with lots of normal saline when it doesn't do the, the thing that we need it to really do, which is carry oxygen? Um, definitive therapy for most people in shock is surgery and blood replacement. We don't have the capabilities of screening people for blood in the field and uh, carrying and storing blood. It's just not practical. Um, and then what we're really looking for in the end is to improve the end organ perfusion. So if we can get a blood pressure of roughly 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury systolic, um, we are still perfusing the organs. No, it's not the 120 over 80 that we typically know, or 130 over 80, 140 over 80, whatever uh, that typical norm is for the person. But it's high enough that the end organs are still getting some blood. So that's usually the rule now. It's just try to keep their blood pressure somewhere in that 90 to 100 systolic range. So fluids obviously are a major piece of equipment that we need when we're talking about uh, IVs. Uh, and we have uh, the three major categories of uh, crystalloids there. Normal saline, or 0.9% sodium chloride. Lactated ringers, which is abbreviated as LR or RL. Uh, normal saline sometimes is abbreviated NS. I don't, I don't like that uh, abbreviation. I think it's easily confused. So um, the 0.9% NaCl shortens it up, hopefully makes it a little, uh, a little more clear. And then 5% dextrose in water, or D5W. Now there are all kinds of other mixtures of this. Uh, well, the one uh, cited there uh, is uh, D5 and half normal saline. They mix them together. Uh, we don't typically give those in the field. Most places these days carry normal saline and maybe a little bit of uh, D5W, just in case they need to give medications. Uh, lactated ringers is kind of 
working its way out of favor, although lactated ringers is the fluid of choice for burn patients. We also have to have the other supplies, such as catheters, whether we're using over-the-needle catheters. We described that in the chapter earlier. That's where the plastic catheter is over the top of the needle, and the needle pulls out from the middle. Uh, we have through-the-needle catheters. This is one in which the needle gets pulled back and hidden into a guard. We sometimes just have plain hollow steel needles or butterfly needles that will get put in and left in. Uh, they're not optimal because they still have the sharp end on them and they can move, they can lacerate the artery, or I'm sorry, not the artery, the vein, the vessel. Um, and uh, so they're no, not optimal, although the, that was the original way to give an IV, was just simply place a steel needle into a vein. You would just have to lie very still. And then the intraosseous needle. Additional supplies. We need an infusion set. Now, typically the large infusion sets are the 10 or 15 drops per cc or drops per mil. A cc, cubic centimeter, and an ml or milliliter is the same volume. So they are used interchangeably. Um, the uh, large or macro drip sets 10 or 15. Uh, so 10 drops makes a milliliter versus 60 drops makes a milliliter. Uh, which one are you going to get accomplished quicker? Obviously, the larger drops. So if you need to infuse larger amounts of fluid, the 10 or the 15 or even the 20 uh, is your uh, preferred. A 60-drop set is a smaller micro-drip set, typically only used anymore for IV infusions of medications, so long-term IV infusions of medications. There is a type of uh, set out of the market now. The brand name one is uh, Select 3 and it actually has three different um, infusion, um, or actually three different drip factors built into its drip chamber. Uh, you can select a 10 drop per cc, a 15 drop per cc, and a 60 drop per cc by simply twisting the drip chamber. Uh, it's kind of neat, kind of expensive, but uh, you know, it definitely covers everything you're going to potentially need. You need something to do uh, uh, skin prep with, uh, alcohol, betadine, chloroprep's, um, a restricting band to help reduce blood flow, tegaderm or vena guard or tape, uh, simply just help secure things. Uh, an arm board is optional, basically like a little board splint that you can put so it helps restrict their arm because if you put, uh, say, an IV in their anacubital fossa, bend to their elbow, if they bend their elbow, they bend their arm, then they can uh, crimp it off and then it doesn't flow well. Labels, um, the labels are only going to be necessary if we are uh, adding medications to the bag uh, for infusion. And then the saline lock is a possibility. So here we have some more equipment. We have the fluid container, whether we use bags or bottles. In EMS these days, we almost always use plastic bags uh, because they're less, uh, less prone to uh, breaking. The only thing you see in bottles really anymore in EMS IV therapy is if the, uh, the field crew is starting a nitroglycerin IV drip. That's usually found in bottles. Other than that, uh, most everything's in bags. You can have anything from 50 cc's to 1,000 cc's. They even make, uh, and it's, we don't usually see them in EMS, but they even make 3,000 cc bags. So um, you have a very uh, wide variety depending on what you need to do. If you need to give the person a lot of fluid, you better have 1,000 cc bags. You just simply need to give them uh, a little bit of uh, medication or have a route open, you know, 100, 250, uh, 500 is enough. So your admin set, like we talked about previously, and then the extensions and stopcocks. Um, in the bottom picture there, you can see there's an IV drip set. Uh, the cap is off the spike uh, that goes into the bag. You can see the drip chamber there. Uh, there's a green slide clamp, actually two of them on there. I talked about that uh, in a previous uh, IV lecture, where if you don't want to change the rate on your roller clamp because you're changing a bag. You slide one of those green clips across there, it clamps it off, and then you just unslide it and uh, it should start back at the same rate. You can see that um, in all of those devices in that bottom picture, 
there are blue colored uh, ports there. Uh, generally, if it is a colored injection port like that, it is almost always a needleless system. So you will not need a needle to um, inject something through there. You just simply will screw it on there through what's called the lure lock system. Lure lock. Um, and then in the bottom uh, left corner there of that bottom picture, there's an example of a saline lock. Um, that is a double lumen, so there's two different tubes leading into the same one, versus the one up in the right upper corner of that picture is a single lumen. So, so catheters, generally a plastic tube with a metal stylet it's the, over the over the needle catheter. Sizes differ on their purpose. Uh, 14 is the common large, 24 the common small. Again, typically we do 18s and 20s on medical patients, 14s and 16s on trauma patients, 22s and 24s on people who uh, uh, have little itty bitty veins. Some examples of some safety catheters. Um, we've gone now to the day and age of trying to reduce needle sticks, which is a good thing. Um, coming from the old school of EMS, I can tell you I absolutely hated it when they brought these out. They were the worst thing ever. Um, but uh, I adapted, and uh, now I have no issues with them. But uh, when we were used to uh, the old catheters, they were much shorter, and uh, we didn't have to worry about clicking buttons and whatnot. Uh, they were very simple to work with, but people were getting stuck all the time. So um, the one in the upper right with the pink catheter, the white button, um, that one after you have made your vena puncture and you're ready to withdraw your needle, you simply press the button the white button there and the needle retracts. Um, the one bottom right, uh, that uh, catheter, after you feed the catheter off, um, then it helps to uh, feed a, a blunt rod uh, through the end of the needle. You can see where the, the uh, bevel of the needle is and how that blunt rod has come out there to protect that end. The green one, which uh, would typically be an 18 gauge in the bottom left, that one, uh, after you've stuck the patient, uh, you pull back on, uh, you can see the fat part, it's kind of a finger grip there, right up above the green uh, hub of the catheter. You slide that backwards and you can look at the second one there, you see that it slid back to the end uh, and it pulls the needle up in there inside of a guard. And then the top left there, the blue one that actually has some butterfly wings on it, but uh, that catheter, uh, after you feed the catheter off, there's a, uh, a spring clip that is in the hub of the catheter. And so as you withdraw the needle, that spring clip slides down and covers the tip of the needle. So some safety catheters. So choosing fluids, <laughs> crystalloid versus colloid. Uh, crystalloids will do the job of uh, temporarily improving the fluid uh, levels, the volume replacement, and hopefully will increase cardiac output and blood pressure. Um, they're mostly isotonic solutions are what we're going to want to use as opposed to hypotonic solutions because uh, isotonic solutions generally stay in the vascular space for some time. Hypotonic solutions move out. So. Uh, they don't contain proteins, so that's why they can move. Uh, they move over the tissues. Uh, there are typical examples of the crystalloids, again, sodium chloride and lactated ringers, which are isotonic, and D5W, which is hypotonic. Colloid fluids uh, have large proteins. Uh, I'll give you a good example if you want to check out a colloid solution. Um, go to your fridge, get out an egg, and uh, separate the egg white out from the uh, yolk of the egg. The egg white, the liquid egg white part, um, that is albumin. And albumin is a solution. Uh, we don't use it from chicken eggs, but uh, albumin is a colloid solution. So that would be very similar to some of the, the colloid solutions that uh, paramedics and doctors and nurses would give. They remain in the vascular space for some time, uh, and they uh, do have some blood replacement properties. There are some plasma substitutes, which are hypertonic. Uh, there's very small volume that you give, uh, the dextran, head of starch, plasminate, uh, and it does tend to draw some water from uh, the other tissues to kind of make up uh, the difference. Uh, another uh, thing that they 
routinely are trying is they're working and getting closer and closer to a um, man-made blood replacement. Uh, it's getting close, but uh, yet uh, still, still a few issues. All right, so catheters. Um, we have over the needles are preferred. IO and PEDS or in adults that we can't get an IV on. Size is going to depend on their need and their veins, of course. And a large gauge short length for volume replacement. So a 14 gauge, three quarters of an inch catheter is probably your best bet to get large amounts of fluid quickly, if you can get it. Vein selection. Most patients choose the most distal. This irks my butt when uh, an EMT or a paramedic comes in and sticks. The very first thing they look at is the antecubital fossa. They jam a needle in there and there's great veins further down uh, the patient's arm. Uh, it's not a good thing to have an IV in your antecubital fossa. It's a real pain in the butt. So if you can get it elsewhere like the back of the hand or the forearm, uh, those are much better spots to put it in. And if we miss low, we can move up. If we miss high, we can't move back down because there's already a hole in between where we're putting our IV and where we need the fluid to go. So there's a leak. Hands, forearms, and cubital fossas, um, external jugulars, lower extremities, and your normal anatomy provides clues. Like I mentioned, there's a couple veins in the backs of most people's hands. One good one that runs across the wrist, uh, runs right across the top of your radius there, coming off the base of your thumb. Everybody has two or three good antecubital fossas, um, although sometimes the more puffy the person is, the harder it is to find. And avoid sides with injuries, fistulas, or mastectomies. When a woman's had a breast removed, um, well, a lot of times they take the lymph nodes and uh, it makes fluid management in that extremity difficult. So avoid them if you can. So, if you want to do, uh, get some scientific theory, here you go. How do we uh, determine flow? Well, flow is actually the diameter taken to the fourth power divided by the length of the catheter. So, wow, that's pretty impressive. So, what does that really mean for all of us? Large catheters, higher flow. Short catheters, somewhat higher flow. Large, short catheters, so wide, but short catheters, best flow. Other factors that can affect it, tubing length. If you've got very, very long IV tubing, it slows it down. There's more uh, surface, or there's less surface area, but it's a, a smaller, uh, so it's more constrictive, so it doesn't allow the fluid to run quickly. Size of the vein. You put a catheter in a large vein, and you typically can get the fluid to run a little quicker. Temperature and viscosity of the fluid. Warm fluid flows better than cold. I think this is None of that should be rocket science. So if you need to increase your flow, large veins. So use a large AC or antecubital fossa. Uh, for cardiac arrest, traumas, um, there's a medication paramedics give called adenosine. It has to get to the heart within about 10 seconds. Uh, and D50. D50 is like pushing uh, caro syrup through a syringe. And it's very thick. So large short bores, uh, inch and a quarter, one inch, three quarter inch. 14 gauges, those will move things along quickly. Don't use the 3 inch 14 gauge, that's going to slow you down. Short tubing, use your 10 milliliter or your 10 drop per mil macro drip sets. Don't put an extra extensions on there. Use a warm fluid, use a pressure infuser, wrap a blood pressure cuff around your, uh, your bag. That all will help increase getting the fluid in quicker. Now the flow rates talked about some things that affect flow, catheter size, admin set, the positioning of the IV site and the IV bag. We use gravity to our advantage. So if you start an IV on a person and you set it up next to their ear, it's not going to flow nearly as well as if you hang it on the hook on the uh, uh, roof of the uh, or ceiling of the ambulance. And now it's you know five feet, four feet above the site as opposed to one foot above the site. Gravity is going to work a lot better with that. I've been even known if I start an IV in the patient's house, I'll look around. If there's nobody to hold an IV for me, I'll take a picture off the wall and hang the, the uh, IV bag on the nail. Um, positioning yeah, and uh, infiltration or occlusion. If, if you have swelling, you have a bad IV, it just doesn't flow. And that's one of the ways you figure it out. 
and of course anatomy and physiology. So to do the calculation, the rate is given in an amount over time. So cc's or ml's over minutes or hours. So a good example would be 125 mils an hour or 125 cc's an hour. Remember, it's the same. So once in a while we talk about TKO or KVO. We've said several times that's about 20 to 30 cc's an hour. Uh, and the rate is counted by or is calculated by counting the number of drops in the drip chamber over one minute's time. And the rate is adjusted by the pressure clamp. You roll it up, it opens up. You roll it down, it shuts it down. So it's very simple. So counting drips. This we've got a, uh, a good example here. Of uh, you can see the drips dropping in the drip chamber. There, uh, we're going to count the drips over say 20 seconds, or and multiply it by three, or 30 seconds, multiply it by two. If you really want to count it for a full 60, you don't have to do any math. Um, and since this is a 10 drop set, that means 10 drops equals 1 milliliter. So in order to deliver 100 milliliters of fluid, that means we have to give 1,000 drops. Because if there's 1,000 drops in a milliliter times 100 milliliters, that equals 1,000 drops. We're not going to sit and count 1,000 drops. We're going to count it over X amount of time and, uh, and then do the quick calculation in our head and, and make it work out. So here's our formula. It is the volume to be delivered over the drops per minute times the admin set over the time in minutes. What we're looking for is the drops per minute. So we usually end up rearranging things a little bit. So there again, it just tells you what I said, drops per minute, which is the number of drops you need to equal the volume delivered. The volume to be delivered is how much you are ordered to give the patient. Admin set is the size that equals 1 milliliter, 10, 15, 20, or 60. And the time in minutes, that's important. It needs to be minutes. Do not do it in hours because you won't get the right calculation. It has to be minutes. Okay, so to administer an IV at 110 mils an hour with a 20 drop per milliliter set, how many drops per minute do we need? So we set it up. Because we rearranged the formula, we lost something there. We lost how many drops per minute because we rearranged the formula, and it's actually what we're looking for. So our practice is, um, our problem is, we have 110 mils an hour times our 20 drop set over 60 minutes. We do the calculation out, it becomes two, uh, 2,200 over 60 which is roughly 36.66666 or 37 drops per minute. Since we uh, can't give a portion of a drop, we can give a portion of a, of a milliliter with a syringe, but we cannot give a portion of a drop. We can only give full drops, so we'll generally round up. Practice problem two. Administer an IV at 200 cc's an hour with a 15 drop per mil set. How many drops per minute? So how do we set it up? 200 cc's times our 15 drop set and divided by our time or 60 minutes equals 3,000 over 60 or 50 drops a minute. Practice problem three. Administer an IV at 150 mils an hour with a 10 drop per mil set how many drops per minute? So if you don't want to see the, the answer right away, um, you might want to push pause, and then you can figure it out. We set it up with 150 mils times 10 drops per mil over 60 minutes. Gives us 1,500 over 60, or 25 drops a minute. Practice problem four. A little bit of a curveball here. Administer 80 mils over 20 minutes with a 10 drop set. 10 drop per mil set. How many drops per minute? Again, pause if necessary. 80 times 10 over 20. Remember it's minutes, not hours. 800 over 20 or 40 drops a minute. And practice problem number five. This is the really hard one. 
administered IV at 137 cc's an hour with a 60 drop per mil set. How many drops per minute? You should probably pause your video for a moment and try to figure this one out. We set it up as a 137 times 60 over 60. Through simple math, we can actually do a, uh, uh, we can reduce um, and uh, cross out uh, like terms basically. And so if we cross out 60 and 60, we can get 137, or we can do it the long way, 137 times 60 over 60, that's 8220 over 60, and it ends up being 137 drops per minute. So as long as you have a 60 drop set and it's over an hour, there is really no math to be done here. So that one's kind of a trick. We can rearrange the formula. If we really want to know the number of minutes it's going to take, we can do simple algebra, move stuff around, and um, get the number of minutes it will take by simply going number of mils times grip set divided by drops per minute. So the process of doing the venipuncture. First of all, talk to your patient. Let them know what's going to go on, what's going to happen. Prepare and assemble all of your equipment ahead of time. Inspect your fluids. Spike the bag and flush the tubing. Select the most distal site possible from the various other veins. So start in the hands, work your way up. Look over both arms first before you just decide there's the one. Selecting a site. So we're going to look for a nice straight vein, roughly an inch and a half to two inches in length. Avoid the areas around joints because they're going to be bending. Avoid limbs that have had lymph nodes removed or have AV fistulas or massive injuries. The bifurcations are generally a good spot. I think you can see my cursor here, but right here is a bifurcation in the vein. So uh, if you can't see my cursor, it's uh, right at the wrist. There is a large vein that it's coming down and it splits into a Y. So right where it comes, where the, the two actually merge together, because remember the blood's actually going up here, but where the two veins come together into one and head up the arm there, um, that's a great spot. You split the bifurcation. You stick the needle right between the two veins, right into the big vein. It's usually a great spot to stick. And then palpate the vein. It should be spongy. Remember, if it's hard, it might be something that's not a vein. If it has a pulse, it's definitely not a vein. It's an artery. Here's an example of a person with a dialysis shunt. Yes, it looks crazy and weird and gross and if you don't know what it is, but this is the way that they get their waste out of their body. They go to hemodialysis and they actually plug two different needles into them, one on the artery side, one on the vein side. They'll take the blood out, clean it up in a machine, and put it back in. Not a good place to stick an IV. Go to the other arm. So additional preparation. After you spike the bag, you bleed the line, place that end near the patient. I usually, if I'm in the ambulance, I have the bag hanging from the ceiling. I've spiked the bag. I've uh, run the, uh, the air through the line. I still have the cap on the, the, the bottom end there. And I will take that, that IV line and usually put it over the patient's shoulder of the arm I'm going to stick. So it's right there. I can find it. You got your gloves on, your antiseptic agent, you cleaned up the site, um, you get your tape ready, tear your tape first before you ever think about going to stick because you're going to have a tough time tearing tape with one hand. Put on your constricting band, if you need a cotton ball or a gauze, you'll have that ready. Chucks if you desire, chucks is a uh, basically a big square diaper, uh, that are very absorbent. You can put them under the patient's arm if you think you're going to make a mess and soak up the blood. And then the catheters, several catheters of different sizes near your patient. So you cleanse the site and apply the constricting band. Don your gloves. Open up your catheter and inspect it. The olden days, we actually would try to slip the catheter around a little bit to make sure it wasn't stuck to the needle. Uh, the new safety needles, uh, you're not supposed to do that. Here's some examples of some supplies. We've looked at that on previous uh, um, PowerPoints. 
So once you're ready to make your phenopuncture, stabilize the extremity and stabilize the adjacent skin. So pull the skin taut so you can get the needle through there. If you're pushing skin around, it's just going to be painful. And you're probably going to miss. So approach with the needle bevel up, approximately 15 to 20 degree angle. Confidently make your puncture and slowly advance until you feel a little pop or a give and you will generally then see some blood flash up in the flash chamber. Continue to advance the needle about another two millimeters or so. That gets the catheter inside the vein. Hold the needle steady and slide the catheter into the vein until the hub is up against the puncture site or the skin. Occlude the vein at the, where you assume the catheter's end is. Remove the restricting band or constricting band. Remove the needle, pop the safety latch, whatever it is you need to do, push a button, and place it in the sharps container. Hook up your IV line, and then check for adequate flow. Recheck your drip rate to make sure that it is running normally. And then finally, secure your IV. So here's the bevel. Uh, the bevel is up here, so we want that to be upward. Uh, it gets into the vein, and... Uh, we can get blood flow to start to trickle up the, uh, the catheter there, or up the needle there. You can see how the plastic catheter is back just a little bit from the tip of the needle, hence the reason why you will see blood before the end of the catheter is in the vein. An example of the scalp holding the skin tight. I like that mechanism uh, where you kind of stretch, you pull their fingers downward, and it kind of stretches the skin over their hand. <clears throat> making sure that the catheter is in the vein. That's that whole advancing it to. Um, also, by uh, um, once you start running fluid in there, if you don't see swelling, that's a good sign. So the flash. What does the flash look like? Uh, it looks like a little bit of uh, red filling up in that chamber right there. So it may incrementally inch up there, or it may just be kind of a little... Uh, fill up there. Including the vein above, even then, even then sometimes you get a little blood out. Securing it. So we've got the, uh, the lure lock system here where that screws around on the hub of the cath catheter. And then we're going to put some tape. And the way that I tape it is this first piece of tape is uh, half inch wide and about three to four inches long. I slide it underneath the catheter. So coming from the tubing side, I slide it up to the hub of the catheter because obviously the white part of the catheter is in the skin. Then I'll fold these over in a butterfly method. I'll take another piece of tape, place it across the top of that to hold it steady, and then one more larger piece of tape to kind of secure the rest of my tubing down. So infiltration. Infiltration is when the fluid is going into the tissues as opposed to the venous circulation. Uh, infiltrated IVs can cause pain, tissue damage, and insufficient care. Uh, and the signs and symptoms generally include improper flow, pain, swelling, tenderness, uh, redness, and generally the IV site is cool to the touch. If you're really questioning your IV and is it good, uh, Here's a little trick you can do. If you've got an IV bag hooked up, take your IV ba bag down and put the IV bag lower than the patient's heart. And you will generally see blood start to come up into your tubing. Um, and then if that's the case, then you put the IV back up and usually it will clear right back out. So if you need to discontinue an IV, here's a few reasons. Basically, everything we've covered before whether you've got some infection or reactions going on, catheter shear, which you may or may not know, fluid overload, um, and order from medical control because your IV is now completed. Some examples of those complications. Upper left there, uh, that's most likely from the uh, uh, ex extravasation of a medication uh, like D50 into the skin. Uh, it's caused that uh, skin to start to slough off. Um, upper right, you've got some bruising, 
lower left you have a pyrogenic reaction where essentially they're starting to have a, a modified allergic reaction. Um, the middle picture there is a thrombophlebitis. You can see that uh, the infection is really tracking right up the arm there, right up the vein. And the bottom right over here is from a severe infiltration. You can see how tight the hospital band is on that person. Um, and uh, fluid ran and ran and ran into the tissues, did not go into the vein. Again, just real quickly on discontinuing, I'm not going to dwell much on this. Uh, if you've got your orders to discontinue it, BSI, explain what you're doing, turn off your IV, remove any tape or dressings, cover the site with a dressing, remove the catheter, hold pressure till the bleeding stops and dispose of appropriately, and of course document. Changing a bag, we talked about this other, uh, in the, uh, the other uh, lecture as well. We may need to change a fluid bag to a different type. We may, need, may have one bag runs out. Once we have our orders, uh, what we're supposed to do, uh, check for the correct fluid, and remove it from the outer bag, check it, make sure that it doesn't have any uh, infiltrations, or not infiltration, uh, particulate matter, or uh, it's leaking, it's in date, so on and so forth. BSI, pull the seal from the new bag, clamp the line of your old uh, current running line, invert the old bag and pull the spike out, insert the spike into the new bag, uh, you may have needed to pull off a little cap on the bag as well. Using a little twisting motion, revert the new bag back to a normal upright position. Open the clamp. If necessary, readjust your flow and then discard, discard and document. All right, so IOs and vascular access. This is, uh, a, a lot of this is just strictly um, informational. Common IV sites in pediatric patients, we have peripheral sites. We have some other oddball ones, such as the scalp veins. You may start inner osseous. And in a brand newborn baby, they can actually stick an IV catheter into their umbilical cord or into one of those veins. Um, and nearly any drug or fluid that can be given IV can also be given IO. And there is uh, very little interference during resuscitation because usually it's in the leg. So the IO devices, um, the ones on the left you're familiar with from uh, the textbook. Uh, top left is the uh, easy I.O. gun. Bottom left is the uh, Jamashidi or the manual uh, bone marrow needle. On the right though, uh, the top one is the bone injection gun, like I mentioned. Um, that's a highly spring-loaded uh, device. The bottom right there is the uh, fast one, um, and uh, there's the various components that go with it there, but you can see the uh, spiky device that you shoot into their chest there. Some different dressings and whatnot to go with it, but uh, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting piece of equipment. An example of, uh, you know, they did an x-ray of a person with an IO. You can see that the needle is in the uh, inside the bone. Very briefly, these are different uh, terms for different central catheters that people generally will have either placed uh, almost all of these are placed in their chest uh, or their neck, and uh, one of them, the pick line down in the bottom right, that can actually be placed in their extremities, and uh, it can be uh, a long-term uh, IV that they have. Here's some examples of implanted vascular access devices. Uh, these can be implanted under the skin, so we don't have to start IVs with them. We'll use those Huber needles over on the left there uh, to poke through the skin and then get inside those and uh, do the medication and, and whatnot. Not something you're going to need to, to uh, do, but just the familiarity. We're going to skip over this. This talks about accessing those devices. Um, whether you've got uh, a pick, you know, each device is a little different on how you're supposed to treat it, so we're going to skip that. And then drawing blood from a central venous access device. This guy actually has a his dialysis shunt in his chest there. That's what that device is. Um, it is possible to draw some blood off of there. Uh, paramedics may do that. This is a super IV called a Swan GANS monitoring catheter. Not only can you give fluids and medications through this, but it also tells you a lot about pressures within their body, particularly in their heart. Um, so people don't aren't out walking around the streets with those in. 
and we have an infused port in a little guy here. Uh, it's been implanted there, obviously, under his chest. Looks like he's got an extra nipple, but uh, that's where they can uh, uh, do some quick blood work and fluids. And that really wraps up our uh, discussion on IVs. Uh, hopefully that supplements uh, some of the material out of your book and your other uh, discussions this week. And this should be, hopefully, the last lecture for you uh, if you've seen everything else.